The companies that grow have a tendency of figuring out who they need and then letting that person grow the business. The companies that don't grow, or the individuals, I should say, that you know might not grow, are the guys that are too concerned about how do we grow? How do I grow? How do I do more? And the answer to that is you just can't. If you're doing 60, 70, 80 hours work a week, there's not really that much more you can do. You just don't have the capacity. Welcome to the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. I'm here with Leah Hostetter and Manish Cartier from our team. Guys, thanks for joining. How are you all doing? Hello. Doing well. Thank you. Great. Excellent. So we're going to talk about a really a concept, a mindset that is encapsulated in a book and it's I don't know about you guys, but it's one of the most impactful concepts that that I've ever read. Most business books have like one little nugget in it and you can if you can find that little nugget, you can save yourself a lot of time. But this book, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy is is really about a concept, the concept of who not how. And we're going to dig into this and unpack it and talk about what does it look like? What are some of the most impactful aspects of this concept? And then what does this look like in, in reality? A lot of our clients have embraced the who not how philosophy that we've been working with them on for months. And we will talk about this and then challenge you to think about what who not how looks like in your operation. So I'll kick this off with just a brief summary. The question at the heart of the who not how philosophy may seem simple, but don't let the lack of complexity fool you. By mastering who not how, you'll quickly learn how billionaires and successful entrepreneurs like Dan Sullivan build incredible businesses and personal freedom along with massive success. So the concept is when you want to accomplish something, what we typically do is we ask this question, how am I going to do this? How can I figure this out? And as the title of the book suggests, a better question is who, not how. Instead of asking, how can I figure this out? How am I going to do this? How am I going to achieve this goal? A better question is who can help me achieve this goal? So there's a lot more to this. And the further I go down this rabbit hole, the the deeper it goes. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. Leah, we'll start with you. Talk about what was what were some of the most impactful concepts or ideas that that you took away from this this book he he talks in this book about freedom and there are four areas of freedom that he mentions when you really embrace this who not how concept and i think this is an important thing because we are really all seeking freedom probably in all of these different areas we just may not understand that uh, right off the bat and so those four areas are freedom of time freedom of money freedom of relationships and freedom of purpose The first one feels pretty self-explanatory, right? When we engage with who's, it pulls us away from having to figure out the how. So that clearly, that frees up our time. But beyond that, how does it give us freedom of money and relationship and purpose? So I'm going to share just a little bit more about that. When he is talking about freedom of money, he says, you can't have money freedom until you achieve time freedom. So it's in that assigning the who or finding the who to create the how that you create the time to be able to actually find the freedom of money. Um, what did you guys think about that? That one kind of, it took me a minute. It took me a pause to really get to grasp that. What were your thoughts on freedom of money when he was talking about it? I, I, I might jump in and answer that because I guess, so I listen to the audiobook. I find it much easier to absorb information if I'm doing some sort of physical activity, if I'm running or at the gym or whatever, while listening to an audiobook. <clears throat> and the audiobook's really interesting because there's two authors, there's Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy, mm-hmm. but it becomes very clear that Dan applied the who, not how approach to the book itself. And Dr. Benjamin Hardy did, you know, most of the work with the book and, and Dan Sullivan came through and reviewed it. And at the end of every chapter, they have a conversation where uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy asked Dan Sullivan about the specific chapter and Dan provides examples from his life. So in terms of that freedom thing, 
Dan makes it very clear from the onset that, you know, his approach is always who's the best person to do this job because it's not me. And, you know, if I have the free time, all I'm doing is just finding the right who's to go across. So I think it was a, it was a masterclass in itself as to how to successfully find the who, not how, instead of just <laughs> telling you how to do it sort of thing. Yeah, I really like that too. I listened to the audiobook as well, Manish. And it, I don't know if this is in the actual book because I haven't picked it up. But at the very end, in that interview, I feel like that made everything just come alive. Yeah. Um, so if you are going to go and invest in this book, check, check out the audiobook. I think you'll really enjoy that. That conversation at, end, at the end of every chapter was really cool. But one of the things that really stood out to me as far as freedom of money is when we are engaging with who's. Sometimes I think it's really difficult, especially if you're a high achiever and, and a business owner who's used to doing a lot of things yourself. Sometimes we have this mindset that it's an expense to try to find a who. But we need to shift that mindset and, and re recognize that this is an investment and not an expense. And as you continue to go through these principles of the who, not how, and how that creates freedom for you, it really does create freedom of money because now it's an investment. Your time is now open and available. You've invested in something that's going to open up greater possibilities for you. And that naturally leads to the third freedom, which is freedom of purpose. When you are not bogged down with the day-to-day -day things or the tasks and the things that uh, you have to do all the time, or maybe even things you don't like to do or you're not good at, it's really hard to stay on your purpose. It's really hard to stay focused on your vision and to actually ever achieve it. It feels like you're just constantly grinding. And so finding that who does create the capacity and the freedom for greater purpose. And then finally, it's the freedom of relationships. This I think is really cool because you can view this in a lot of different ways. And I'll probably go into this a little bit more in depth as we continue the conversation. But not only does it open up opportunity for you to have greater and um, deeper relationships with the people that really matter to you, but it also opens up more possibilities because you're finding the right people to surround yourself with. And one of the things I loved about this is he really honed in on creating value for everyone around you, not just taking from the who's, but creating value, building a relationship with them, seeing how you can engage with them and how you can provide value to them first before you are accepting something from them. So that's just at high level. I know we're probably going to dive in a little bit deeper, but I really liked how he broke this down into those four areas of freedom based on this principle of who, not how. I, I just want to touch on the <clears throat> the investment part as well, because you could add another layer with the who, not how that it's actually, let's say, you know, most of our listeners are construction business owners. And if you're looking at hiring someone, most people tend to anchor themselves to an annual salary and go, all right, it's going to cost me $80,000 or $100,000 or whatever to hire someone to do one of the jobs that I'm currently doing because you're probably wearing multiple hats in the business. And you kind of think of it as that money coming out of your own pocket, but it's not really because the investment comes from the client. Usually whoever you hire is hired to provide a service to a client and the client pays the bills. And the best way to think about it is that, no, this money's not coming out of my pocket. The who in this scenario or the investor is the client. And if I hire this individual and I'm able to pay for them with the, the, the invoices that are being paid for by my client, we're able to do a lot more um, as a business, right? We're able to be a lot more productive instead of me being the bottleneck and holding it back. So those who's in the situation are two different people. That are not you. You're not paying and you're also not doing the work. And we've seen this yeah. happen with our clients, right? Where they've <laughs> disengaged from all of the tasks, I guess that you could call it, that uh, have to happen in a business and have found the right who's. Their business has increased and significantly. <laughs> Their revenue has increased significantly. And it wasn't a burden, like you to your point, Manish, it wasn't a burden on their personal uh, checkbook. Mm -hmm. And you're not yeah. paying that figure all at once is another thing to say there. You know, it costs X amount of dollars a week to build up to that figure. But mm -hmm. that full week, the 40 hours that that employee is contributing to your business is directly turning into billable time. And you're seeing a return on that investment every week instead of it happening over time. Yeah. And uh, an example, there are a couple of examples that come to mind. Um, one of our clients it became clear 
that he needed to get out of operations. He needed to hire a high-level operations manager. And I remember having conversations, him thinking like, oh, wow, you know, I, I don't know if I can afford to pay this amount. I don't remember the, what the exact numbers were, but it was like, oh, this person's going to cost $90,000 a year. And I just, I don't know if I can afford that. So one of the things that the author talks about in this book is the, how when we focus on the how we, there's, it comes from a place of scarcity. It's based on the scarcity mindset. We, we think, well, we have to do it ourselves. We can't afford to hire somebody, right? And this is pretty typical. When it becomes clear somebody needs to hire someone, their first response is, well, I don't think I can afford it. I can't afford it. How am I going to afford it? Because they're looking at it from a cost standpoint. So we had this conversation with our, our client. He expanded the role that he was looking to hire for. And instead of just hiring, say, a project manager, he decided it became clear he needed somebody who could take over operations completely. So he increased his salary cap, say, $10,000, something like that. All right. I don't remember the exact numbers, but he increased his salary cap to something that he thought was a stretch. And he found the right hire, brought this person in, and... During, I think, the first two years of this person being there, they increased revenue by close to 100%. Increased profits by, created seven figures of profits in one year, okay? Over a million dollars of profit in one year. And he did that because he opened up his salary cap. He got out of that how. How am I going to run operations? And he embraced the who, not how concept. And by increasing his salary cap, ten or twenty thousand dollars, this person, one person, led to million dollars in net profit. So that's a big ROI. So when you embrace the who, not how philosophy and start looking at people as an investment, when you hire the right people in the right structure and put them in the right role and have the right systems and processes for them to follow, they more than pay for themselves. And it is an investment. And I really think, I think this is a mindset that, um, that keeps a lot of small construction business owners stuck. I think a lot of them are, they're wondering, well, how do these other companies grow? How do they scale up? I think it's because, the companies that grow and scale, they look at people as an investment. And small companies that stay stuck look at people as a cost. And they're stuck in the, what um, I think one of the, either Dan Sullivan or Benjamin Hardy talked about the opportunity cost of how. The opportunity cost of how. When you are stuck thinking about, well, I can't afford a who, I have to figure out how to do it myself you get hammered by opportunity costs. Um, what do you get? Manish, what do you think? And then Leah, I'd like to know what you think. Do you feel like, like, is this part of the reason? Is this, is the who, not how concept or thinking of people as an investment? Is that one of the big differentiators between companies that grow and companies that don't? What do you think? Yeah, hundred percent. Like it's it, the companies that grow have a tendency of figuring out who they need hiring that person, and then letting that person grow the business. You know, the companies that don't grow or the individuals, I should say, that, you know, might not grow are the, are the guys that are too concerned about, like you said, how, you know, how do we grow? How do I grow? How do I do more? And the answer to that is you just can't. If you're doing 60, 70, 80 hours work a week, there's not really that much more you can do. You just don't have the capacity. And let's be honest, if you're working that much, first of all, you can't be performing to your optimum. It's just not possible, right? You're probably burnt out or, or whatever. And secondly, there's probably other areas of your life that are suffering as well. Whereas if you then look at it objectively and go, all right, I'm wearing multiple hats, I need to hire someone. If you hire someone else, it unlocks a lot more operational capacity for the business. If you continue doing that, 
you know, all of a sudden you have a team of five, a team of 10, a team of 20, or whatever the case may be. But the team has much, much higher operational capacity compared to you as a sole individual or you with yeah. a team of three, let's say. And yeah. It allows you to then make the most of all the who's that are in your team uh, and provide a better service to your clients, have a better sales conversion rate. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot more, I guess, people involved in actually making sure every different aspect of the job is working out perfectly. But if you're stuck there thinking, how can I afford that first individual, you're probably always going to be stuck there. Yeah. What do you think, Leah? Do you feel like <clears throat> this um, it, this mindset is what is the differentiator between companies that grow or and companies that get stuck? What do you think? I 100% think so. And if you even think about the wording that you used, uh, in, in investment versus a cost. <laughs> We're talking about people. <laughs> if a person is a cost, they're always like a burden to you, right? There's some underlying like negative uh, viewpoint of that person or that position or that step that you've taken versus if you're thinking, this is an investment. This is an investment in this person. This is an investment in my company. There's a very different energy that goes with both of those. And one of the things that they talk about in this uh, book, when you're considering who versus how, um, it is in relation to relationships, it's transformational versus transactional. Hmm. So if it is a cost, that's a transaction. And that's all it is. It's cold. It's dead. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but if it's an investment, that is transformational. It's transforming that person. It's transforming your business. There's a very different energy with both of those. And you mentioned scarcity complex, right? Or the scarcity mindset. If it's a cost, that's a scarcity mindset. If it's an investment, that is very different. So even just looking at it that way, it, I think it's very telling of which direction you're headed down. You're really kind of moving down one road, which is not so positive and will probably keep you stuck versus another one where you are reaching for something better. And you're likely going to get it because that's your that's your viewpoint, that's your mindset. And I I want to address like it doesn't have to necessarily just be employees either, mm -hmm. right? It's it's anything. Now, if you're sitting there wondering, you know, yeah, you're, you're saying to yourself, I can't afford to hire someone because I'm not winning enough work or converting enough work, or I don't have enough leads. Uh, most construction business owners that come through with us, they're usually from the operational side, right? They're great at building. They're not that great at sales and marketing and all that sort of stuff, but they're trying to figure that out themselves. And there's, there's a pretty, you know, they're learning, they're trying to build their own websites and things like that. Whereas you can always outsource that stuff to a professional or an agency that can do it in a fraction of the time it's going to take you and therefore a fraction of the cost. But people think if I just do this myself, it doesn't cost me anything. Like you've already mm -hmm. touched on, Todd, there's a pretty significant opportunity cost, right? If you're spending a hundred hours building your website and someone else can do it in three, there's obviously pretty significant opportunity cost to those 97 hours that you could have been spending doing something else that adds value to business. Hey guys, Todd DeWalda here. And let me ask you a tough question. Think about this. What would happen to your family and your business if you died next week? Would your family have access to things like your will, your trust, life insurance, bank accounts, and investment accounts? Are your estate planning documents up to date and easily accessible? And what would happen to your business operations? Could someone write checks? Would your team know what to do? And would they have the information they need to keep things going? These are important questions. And it's why we created the Legacy Vault Accelerator Program. And the Legacy Vault Accelerator is designed specifically for construction business owners. And our goal is to help you compile all of your essential personal and business information into one secure digital location. In other words, your own legacy vault. So imagine having everything your family and your team would need right at their fingertips if something happens to you. We're talking about financial records, business operations, personal documents, all organized and accessible in a secure digital vault. This is crucial for ensuring that your legacy continues smoothly, no matter what life throws your way. So join us in the Legacy Vault Accelerator. 
and have the peace of mind that comes from knowing you've done your job to set up your family and your business to succeed when something happens to you. You can take the first step over at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash vault, V-A-U-L-T today. Don't leave your business's future and your family's well-being and your legacy to chance. Head over to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash vault to get all the details. So let's let's talk about opportunity cost in, in just a minute. But here's what's interesting. 100% of general contractors embrace the who not how philosophy. You might be thinking, I'm a general contractor. I don't, but I'm just, I feel like I, I can't afford to hire people. If you've ever written a subcontract agreement or used a subcontractor, you've embraced the who not how because you, you could figure out how to do electrical, plumbing, HVAC, whatever, but you've, you've decided I'm just going to find a who to do it. And it's part of the, it's just the norm for general contractors to embrace who not how with certain things. But this philosophy also applies to a lot of other things like, Manish mentioned sales, marketing, websites, financials, lots of other parts of the business. And um, you just need to expand that that philosophy instead of – so if there's probably something right now you're thinking of. How am I going to fill in the blank? How am I going to figure that out? And what we're challenging you to do is to think, ask a better question, who can help me achieve this goal? so that you can avoid this opportunity cost. So let, let's talk about opportunity cost. This is kind of a, it's a nebulous concept, but what we're saying is if you're spending, like for example, there's, there's an example in the book where a CEO decided he would learn how to code his own website. So he spent 100 hours learning how to code, staying up at night, pulling his hair out, trying to learn how to create a website. And then finally, he threw up his hands and asked for a web developer to give him a price. And it was like 1,200 pounds or $1,200. And he felt like a jackass because he had just spent 100 of his hours on something that he was no good at, trying to figure out how. And if he had just started with the question, who can do this first, he could have paid the $1,200 and spent those 100 hours doing something else. So for people who are stuck in the, the cost mindset, I think it's helpful to, to talk about, you know, there's a cost, but opportunity cost is likely much bigger than whatever you think it's going to cost you. So what, what are some of the, the really high value activities that people aren't getting to right now because they're stuck in the how philosophy? Like, um, Leah, what do you think? What what are you've worked with hundreds of folks in our program? What are they when they get the right people in place? What are the things they can now go do that are really high value tasks? I think it's really twofold. It's all the things in their business lay, staying in their strengths. Right, um, every single one of our clients they have a strength, but so many of them are. Um, not delegating the things that they don't like to do or that they just hate doing. <laughs> and the moment they unhinge from those things, they're able to focus on their strengths. And that's when sales increase because maybe they're the best person to be doing the sales. Or that's when leadership increases and they're helping to um, promote and encourage and inspire the people on their team to continue to do better and the whole business rises. There's just so many ways where they can disengage from the day-to-day -day tasks that they're just not meant to do, other people are better suited for it. And now everything thrives. Now that's just business, right? But let's talk about their personal lives and how when they're able to get all of these things in place and unhinge from the stuff that doesn't matter for them to be doing, they're finding the right who's and they're empowering them to do things, their lives are thriving. And I know Manish and Todd, you guys can probably tell even more stories about this from your folks in CEO Alliance who are going on two and three week vacations and picking up hobbies that they never thought they could and spending time with their kids at their, their, their sports events and things like that. So there's so much, I think of life that we potentially can miss out on. It's the opportunity cost. And those are the moments that really matter. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those uh, I've, I've heard, I've had calls with people who've said things like in my early sixties and I'm watching my life pass me by because they're stuck in stuck working in the business, stuck in the how philosophy. Um, one guy said, I have two grandsons and I've never taken them fishing and it's a damn shame. And that's a, that's a huge opportunity cost. And I think maybe another word for that would be regret. And I heard um, Jim Rohn, there's a Jim Rohn quote that says, discipline, discipline weighs pounds, regrets weigh, regret weighs tons. You get to pick which one you have. Are you going to deal with the weight of discipline or are you going to deal with the weight of regrets when it's too late to do anything about it? Yeah, so relationships, health, there are a lot of things that can't be can't be measured, can't be quantified, but are are incredibly important. Um, Manish, what do you think? When you think about the opportunity cost of how, what what uh, how would you describe that? I think it's twofold. So you know, I I'm probably on the other end of that spectrum where I had convinced myself that I love working. I love chaos. I thrive under chaos. You know, these stupid beliefs that you kind of tell yourself because that's all you're used to. So you're just constantly stuck under this cloud and you can't actually see what else is available to you, right? Because you're just like, no, if I just keep telling myself this lie, I'll just stay in here and make sure I do my job sort of thing. But as an example, one of the first things that that most people give away is estimating. Most Most of our clients hate it. And they, they tend to get into a bidding war, you know, with themselves when they're estimating a project to then potentially win it, potentially not win it, and then feel terrible about it and just continue down that cycle. Whereas the, the guys that have then successfully hired an estimator or a pre-construction manager and offloaded those, those responsibilities, or I should say the outcome of estimating and, you know, potentially winning a job to someone else, they're able to actually take the time to do something that they do truly enjoy, whether that's work-related, whether that's personal, it doesn't matter. But more importantly, it's about getting rid of the thing that you don't, like it, it's making your day worse. And, you know, if it's going to be that way, you're not going to be good at it. And again, like I, I keep saying that, but to me in a construction business, like if you're looking for efficiencies, improvements in profit, you can't continue doing something if you ask yourself, you're genuinely not good at it. You're just doing it because you think there's no other option. Yeah. So how can I get better at estimating? How can how can I get better at um, playing whack-a-mole? I think that's basically what a lot of people are asking to do. It's like, how do I get better at managing the chaos? How do I get better at um, doing these things I hate? Yeah, that, that's an okay question. But a better question is, who can I get that would get me out of estimating that would do as good of a job at, as I can and probably better because they like it and they're focused on it? I think this is a misconception people have along with I can't afford to hire somebody because they're stuck in that cost scarcity mindset. But then they think, well, nobody's going to do it as good as I can. That's that's not what I've seen. What we've seen over and over with our clients is when they when they're clear on what they want and what they need, and they articulate the vision, they attract the right people, and these people come in and they do better than the owner ever could because they enjoy it, they're good at it, and they're completely focused on wearing one hat instead of trying to wear all the hats. So this is why it's an investment. It's not like you're just going to break even hiring the right who. You're going to get a great ROI. So think about it. If you Let's say you invested $100,000 in annual salary, and all you did was increase your net profit by $100,000. You paid their salary and increased your net profit by $100,000. You, you've doubled your investment in 12 months. Are there many investments out there where you can 
put a hundred thousand dollars in and get get a one hundred thousand dollar dividend, like get a one hundred percent return in one year? No. But that's that's how that's what good people will do for you. You'll they will give a return on investment when it's set up set up the right way. And that's just the tangible return. There's also the intangible where now all of a sudden someone else has come in. They're doing 40 hours a week that you used to do. And now how are you using that time? Yeah. And of course, there's, there's stuff in the business, but also personal stuff as well. And if you're, if you're able to now finish work earlier and get to spend an extra hour a day with your kids who are eventually going to grow up and it's not going to be cool to hang out with mom and dad anymore, you know, you, you're be making all these precious memories that are invaluable and you're able to do that because currently there's someone else in the office doing what you used to do after hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually went through this process with a client once who it became clear he'd been doing estimating for years. He hated it. He was not good at it. He was not a detail guy. So we just broke it down and I said, okay, if um, let's say we, we brought somebody else in, how much would it cost? And there was a number, $80,000, let's say. And he was thinking, uh, oh, cost, how am I going to come up with that much more gross profit to cover that overhead? Well, there's a couple of different ways we can recoup that. So I said, how, uh, how many mistakes are you making right now? What are you missing in your estimates? Things that are slipping through the cracks, what kind of profit bleeds can be attributed to the fact that you're doing the estimating? Well, it's probably five grand a month. Okay, well, there's $60,000 we're going to recoup right there. We almost paid for the salary, this person's salary just by eliminating the mistakes and the profit bleeds, right? Then on top of that, I said, if you could get out of estimating and go focus on something else, what would you do? And he said, oh, I would, I would go uh, work my relationships with realtors and architects and I would sell. I, could, I would sell more work. Okay, how much more work do you think you would sell? I could probably bring in $2 million. Okay. And what would your gross profit be on that? And he said, a number. So it was 15% gross profit. Okay. So there's $300,000 of gross profit. So we just, you hire this person, it, they cost $80,000. And you just told me how they would create $360,000 of gross profit what do you think you should do? And he said, I think I'll go post a job description for an estimator because the opportunity cost was huge. And that does, didn't even take into account all of the other, the intangibles. So people are an investment. People are an investment. And I, I'm glad you brought that up, Leah. So w when, uh, think about, I'm curious what you think about this, Leah. You're um, much more, emotionally connected than Manish and I are, which isn't saying a, lo a whole lot. We're, we're pretty robotic, <laughs> but how, let's say if an owner feels like they believe that their people are a cost, what will their, how will their employees and their team members feel that? What They'll do you think? feel just as though they're a transaction, right? <laughs> it's a means to an end. Um, I think if you can put yourself in that situation and say, what would it feel like to, to be a cost to someone? You're a burden. You're a necessary evil to be there, right? There's all sorts of ways that you could probably paint that picture. But if you consider that they're an investment and not just an investment for your company, but how are you investing in them so that they can be an investment in your company? And that's one of the things that um, I really liked from this book. And one of the quotes that he said is never enter a relationship without having first created value in that relationship. I think that's key. Now, I think he was saying that in relation to finding those who's that can help you to continue to thrive and to continue to do bigger and better things. And he actually uses an example, I think of, um, oh gosh, you guys help me out with this. I think it was, uh, who's the Virgin Airline guy, Airlines guy? Richard, Richard Branson. Branson. Richard Branson. Yeah. So he had, he had, uh, I think he had, um, did an auction to win a dinner with Richard Branson. And so he had won that dinner and it was him and a handful of other people who got to go and meet with him. And he immediately added value 
to Richard Branson by talking to him about his charity and saying, hey, have you thought about doing this? Or have you thought about doing this? And let me introduce you to this person where every other person who was there just wanted something from Richard Branson. But he immediately provided value. And to this day, he's one of his very good friends. And they continue to have this relationship because he provided value. So he first created that value. And obviously that's on a much bigger scale, right? And that has benefited him in the long run. But if you can use that same concept with the people that you engage with to join your team, or maybe it's a marketing company, or it's the folks that do your website, how can you create value in that relationship first? Then it is no longer transactional, it's transformational. And by the way, it's not just going to transform that person. When you engage with someone that way and you're creating value for that person, it transforms you too. It helps you to become a much better leader. And that also helps people to want to be around you. Now you've upgraded everything. (laughs) That is a win-win for everybody. Yep. I like it. Um, One of the things that he said in in the book was that focusing on who instead of how increases your commitment and your clarity to your vision. I want to talk about this, this a little bit. Um, focusing on who increases your commitment and clarity to your vision. So what I, what I took away from that was that when you, when you commit to bringing on a who to investing in somebody that forces you to to articulate your vision. And when you make that investment, um, when we pay, we pay attention. So my takeaways from that were when you bring on a who, it forces you to articulate your vision. You get really clear on what you want. It forces you to, if you do it right, to articulate exactly what winning looks like for that, that person. And by making that investment, you're more committed to your vision. Manish, what do you think about that? Does that does that make sense to you? Am I that when you invest in a who, it, it forces you to to get more clear and be more committed to your vision? Definitely, and and it's also when you you know in that situation, you're not just getting someone to help out, but you're getting someone involved who's also asking questions of you that you probably haven't considered yourself and thought of yourself as well right so in in those specific examples like if if you've hired an estimator let's say and they start asking questions of very specifically to do with the process which you've either never considered or you just didn't know the answers so you just kind of left them and um whereas this individual might actually be able to not just ask you those questions but give you those answers and like leah was saying actually add value to the process as well and and going back, you've, if you're if you're looking at adding value back to them, it's like, all right, how do we make estimating easier together, so that we can get more estimates out, or whatever whatever the metric may be. And the, the same thing applies, you know, on operations with sales with, with anything else. So it's not just that you're paying for someone's time to do a specific task, but you're getting a lot more, you know, knowledge and information out of it which helps you kind of eliminate some of your blind spots to things that you just never in perceived. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's about, um, this may be a misconception. One of the misconceptions that people are stuck in is people, um, are a cost, right? I think the other one is hiring more people means more headache. I don't want to hire hiring more people means I'll just have more people to tell what to do. And I believe it's in the book, The E-Myth, he talks about, he calls this the genius with a thousand helpers. And what we're talking about is not hiring helpers that you have to tell what to do. We're talking about hiring who's that will be accountable for results. You're delegating results to these people, not just hiring a gopher to tell what to do. And when you, when you do that, when you bring, when you invest in the right person, they will, they'll probably be better than you at, at something and they will challenge you. And when you delegate that result to them, you can kind of get out of the way to some degree. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, that reminds me of, a, of an example in the book. Uh, it was Henry Ford, I think, and he was called into a congressional hearing and the politicians were throwing all sorts of general knowledge questions at him to test his intelligence or, you know, or whatever. And eventually he got sick of this and just said, look, I, I don't have the answers to your questions, but I do have a team of employees who I can press a single button on my phone and I can get the answer to all of these questions. That's what I have. And that's what he needs to, you know, run Ford Motor Company successfully, which was, which is a key point because, yeah, exactly with what you said, you yourself have certain limitations and you don't have the answers to all the questions and you don't need to, right? So you don't, you don't need to follow a process of educating yourself on every single thing. Um, another example I want to give is kind of if your bottleneck is that you haven't, you're simply not getting enough leads because your business is based on referral, you're trying to learn how to do social media, you're trying to learn how to do marketing and ad campaigning and all sorts of stuff. You're spending so much time, which again is an opportunity cost, whereas you could just engage a marketing agency and say, look, we need this specific, you know, this is our target market. This is our best type of clients, the people that we love working with, the type of jobs that are profitable for us. Can you figure out a strategy and tell me how much it's going to cost for me to get more of those successful leads? Instead of you, let's say, trying to pay for an ad campaign that you've set up on Facebook or whatever yourself, only to then find out that the types of leads you're getting for them aren't good leads. They, they're either not converting to jobs or if they are converting to jobs, they're not really the type of client that you want to work with. Hey guys, Todd here. If you own a custom home building or remodeling business, let me ask you a few questions. First, how often do you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about project details, financial issues, or something else about your business and you can't go back to sleep? Are you spending more than 10 hours a week working in the business, wearing multiple hats, putting out fires, and you feel like you can't work on your business as much as you want? Number three, do you have enough documented systems and processes, or is it all in your head? Number four, how good is your handoff of projects from the office to the field? Are you getting hammered by the just enough to start trap, doing just enough to start? And then lastly, do you feel stuck? Do you feel like you need to grow, but you're scared to, and you don't know how to do it? Maybe it feels like you need to hire, but you're afraid to make a mistake and you're worried you can't afford to hire somebody. Well, if any of that resonates with you, you're not alone. And if you want to make your business a source of more freedom and a source of less stress to systematize your construction business, and our team here at Construction Leading Edge has helped over 300 builders and remodelers systematize their business and we can help you too. The first step is to schedule a call with my team by going to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply. That's constructionleadingedge.com forward slash A-P-P-L-Y. Or you can send a text to this number, 877-755-2410 with the word apply. That's 877-755-2410. Just text the word apply and we'll get back to you. Now, let's get back to our episode. Yeah, yeah that's that's good. Here, so you mentioned bottleneck. I'm curious, how do you how does the the how mindset cause the owner to be the bottleneck in their organization? Because a lot of small business owners, whether they realize it or not, they are the bottleneck in their organization. They are, John Maxwell has one of his laws of leadership. It's the law of the lid. And he says, your leadership ability is the lid on your, your organization. So um, how do you, how do you think the, the how philosophy, how do I do this causes a business owner to be the, the bottleneck? What do you think, Leah? Um, I'm actually looking at a quote from the book that I think answers this perfectly. Um, he says, it can be easy to achievers who want to control what they can control, which is themselves. 
It takes vulnerability and trust to expand your efforts and build a winning team. It takes wisdom to recognize that one, other people are more capable and enough, are more than capable enough to handle much of the hows, and two, that your efforts and contribution, your hows, should be focused exclusively where your greatest passion and impact are. Your attention and energy should not be spread thin, but purposefully directed where you can experience extreme flow and creativity. So I know he kind of took that even further than what your initial question was, but we work with high achieving people. You wouldn't own a business if you weren't a high achiever, right? That's that's not an easy thing for most people to do. And a lot of us want to control a lot of things. And many times that can get us into trouble, right? We can control ourselves. Um, I know every single one of us is like, oh, I can do it because I know I will do it. <laughs> but the, it, the challenge is everything slows down. You are the bottleneck. You're the, you're the challenge that's keeping you from growing, keeping your business from growing, keeping everything from moving forward and moving up. And it does take vulnerability and it does take trust to say, okay, I need some other people here. I need some good hows, or excuse me, I need some good who's. But it's also about creating a winning team. It's not just simply about putting people in and giving them marching orders. And you touched on this earlier, Todd. It's finding the right people. It's finding really capable, gifted people whose strengths lie where your weaknesses are and then giving them um, and empowering them to uh, create results and then letting them go. That I think is, is a big part of it. And that's, that trust can be hard. <laughs> it can be hard, but is very necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Vanish, what do you think? I think How, um, what do you think? I, I was going to say, you know, it's interesting. I think that's begged me to ask because my principle, like, so, you know, I'm a general contractor, I'm a carpenter by trade, and I think most of us coming from the field side, it's usually, it's usually important if you've worked your way up the ranks that you kind of know a bit about everything. You know, like let's say you specialize in building new homes. You tend to, even if you're a carpenter or something, you tend to know a little bit about concreting, electrical, plumbing, and you, you feel that you need to so that you can supervise and manage subs or employees more effectively, right? It's important for you to know who's doing their job well and who's not so that you can actually assess and evaluate that. But I think what happens with being a business owner is you take that mentality out into owning the business and you're going, no, well, before I hire someone to be an estimator, to be a project manager, to be you know a designer or whatever, I need to do all that. I need to learn a lot myself, be good at it myself, so that then I know how to tell this person to do their job so that I know how to check their job and make sure that they're doing it well, et cetera. So I think a lot of us tend to take that construction approach to business, but I don't, I don't feel that it applies and I don't think it's, it's allowing you to actually effectively delegate that well. Yeah, that's really good. There's, there's a statement that is very common that I, I don't think is, is smart. Um, I don't think it's appropriate. People would say, well, a good leader would never ask somebody to do something they wouldn't do themselves, right? A good leader would never ask somebody on their team to do something they wouldn't do themselves. And if you believe that, then you believe you have to be able to do everybody's job. And I, I somewhere in the book, he talks about the value of being incompetent. I'm not sure if that's the exact word he said, but... If you embrace the who, not how philosophy, you embrace incompetence. You're saying, look, I don't know how to do this. I don't want to know how to do this. I don't need to know how to do this. In fact, learning how to do this thing doesn't make sense. I need to find the who to do it. And I, I heard somebody say this, um, that billionaires are, I don't remember the exact word. He said, billionaires are incompetent. And the example he used was if, if a billionaire owns a, say, owns a restaurant, high end restaurant, and the chef quits, the billionaire restaurant owner would not try to go in and figure out how to be a chef. They would hire a chef. They would find a who. Because if that person tried to take the construction approach and say, well, I'll just step in here and I'll figure out how to do it, then it wouldn't work. They would be stuck cooking all day long. The food would suck. The 
customer experience would suck. They would be getting hit with opportunity cost and they would, they would drag everything down. So I think, yeah, that the construction mentality where we have to know how to do everything so you can tell people how to do it. I think that's, that, that's, that's what keeps us in. That's what causes the bottleneck because if you feel like you have to know how to do everything, so you understand everything, you can instruct everybody, you can check their work, then you, you've just created a fantastic bottleneck. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So let's talk about um, some real life examples. What does it look like to embrace the, the who, not how philosophy? We've, I've shared a couple of examples of clients, um, but I'm curious, Manish, in the work you've done with our clients, can you share an example or two of what, what embracing the who, not how philosophy looks like? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to hiring people, for example, you know, the, we had clients that would formulate this uh, this vague description, this job description, put it on Indeed or any of those type of websites or, you know, hopefully get something out of their social circle. And then there's, there's a couple of uh, uh, very specialised construction-related recruitment services out there they started just going to these guys and going, I need you to help me come up with a position, you know, the, the description of this position, exactly what task this person is going to be doing and help me interview and, and hire this right person as well. And that reduced their sort of workload for that whole exercise down to about 10%. And, you know, if you figure that out compared to the cost that it takes to hire someone, it was substantially less. And, the hire was a lot more uh, suitable, you know, a lot more successful, I should say, instead of them going down the traditional route and then letting someone go after two or three months because they didn't hire successfully to begin with. So it improved their chances of success in that regard. So that's 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 one of the examples. But then with, with most of it, being a business owner, uh, being a CEO of a construction company, there's multiple facets of the business that you need to be on top of, right? You need to review a lot of things so that you can make informed decisions for the business and for the future of the business, strategic informed decisions. One of the biggest aspects we've seen from all of our clients who are CEOs is none of them are interested in the financial side of the business. They're obviously interested in the financial results the performance and, you know, what they need to do to improve that performance, but not actually interested in all the administrative work that goes into building the, the presenting those results, I should say. So, you know, maintaining QuickBooks or whatever format they're using. But a lot of them are stuck in or used to be stuck in doing the bookkeeping activities, which is just a waste of their time. And the, the guys that ended up hiring bookkeepers – and then, you know, beyond that, hiring someone to actually come in and be CFOs and things like that as well, started seeing a lot more success because they could now switch on to being a CEO and do the things that they need to do as a CEO instead of also doing bookkeeping, something that they also were not good at. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic one. A lot of people think, how can I do my own books? How can I learn accounting? How can I do all of this stuff? Stop. Yeah ask who and our answer that to that question is apparatus contractor services so if you're thinking i'd love to find a who to handle my accounting and find a who that knows construction go to goapparatus.com goapparatus.com and there's a, a link on our website if you go to our trusted partners page um, you can find them. And yeah, the recruiting agency you talked about, instead of asking, how am I going to find these people? How am I going to interview them? How am I going to, how am I going to find time to do this? Don't ask who, who can do this stuff for me. And then I know several of our CEO Alliance members have hired virtual assistants and they asked who can find an assistant for me. So they 
or who can do this stuff for me? And maybe even who can find an assistant for me? So they, instead of asking, how can I find a virtual assistant or how can I get all this stuff done? They said, who can find a qualified trained virtual assistant for me and then let them do the legwork? Yeah. Classic example. Um, Leah, what about you? What are some examples, any examples come to mind of clients who have embraced the, the who, not how philosophy? Yeah, we actually have a client who's uh, rounding out the SYCB program right now. And uh, it's an eight week program, and probably about week three or four. He realized mm -hmm. that he wasn't the right who. He, uh, you know, we talk a lot in the program about a visionary and an implementer. And this particular client, he's a visionary. And he knew who his implementer was in his business. And so he bowed out. <laughs> he delegated this program over to his implementer and said, this is now yours. This is your baby. Go do it. And he showed up for all the calls and he did all of the work and he is implementing everything into his business. And so that's that's a pretty bold uh, who, not how shift that we saw happen with one of our clients halfway through this program. And he's thriving. Their business is thriving. He's taking everything to a whole other level because he's engaging with finding the right who's um, to continue to move forward. And it is truly a transactional or um, do I say that right? <laughs> uh, it truly is a transformational relationship, not a transactional one. Yeah. Um, there we go. I said it right. <laughs> he's engaging and creating value for all of these folks as well as he's going through. So that one is one that's coming to mind right off the bat because, you know, he was super engaged and loving the program, but he realized I'm not the right guy to do this. And uh, he, he found that who and, and, uh, implemented that right away. Yeah. And it's so, so liberating when I, I love when I love to see the look on people's face when they realize, ah, I don't have to do this shit anymore. I don't have to do this. <laughs> I, I can find somebody. I can find a who that's incredible. I, I don't, I don't have to figure out how to do my books. I don't have to figure out how to, find and hire and train or uh, onboard people. I don't have to figure it out all, all on my own. I don't, I don't have to do it all myself. It's so, so liberating. And it's fun to see when people really, really embrace that and then they get to, to feel that freedom. Um, so some of the examples of the questions that people are asking, a lot of the people we, we work with, come to us and they're asking questions like uh, a lot of how questions. How can I, how can I have more time? Right. Um, how can my superintendents get better at time management? This is a question. Um, how, how can I figure out my pre-construction process? How can I design my business to run without me? Um, how, how can I develop, how do I find the time to create systems and processes and try things and figure out what, what works? Um, Manish, what are some of the other quests, the, the how questions that you would get from the folks that you talked to before we worked with them? I think it's uh, one of the biggest things is obviously people that do have an existing team and they're trying to improve their processes as they're going through, you know, and systematizing their business. They'll get their team in, get the team's feedback, et cetera, all the solutions. But then their next question to us usually is like, all right, how do I go through and now build and create all these processes? How do I document all these sort of things? And even at that point, we have to remind them that, they already have a team. They quite simply just need to figure out who's the best person in their team or the best people in their team to split up all these tasks with and continue to remind them that, you know, this isn't something that you have to do yourself. So stop having the how mentality and continue throwing it back to your team because there is also a sense of pride when someone from your team creates something or, you know, solves a problem within the business. They own that. They own the solution and it makes them feel good about actually contributing towards the success of the entire team. And if you rob them of that opportunity and decide to do that yourself, you're not doing much to improve the culture of the business and the morale of the business. I think a common misconception is that 
people think in order to be good leaders, they have to do everything themselves for their team. And that's not the case. They just have to effectively allow the team to do things, you know, and support the team in the team doing things. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. That's good. So if you're listening to this and you're wondering, how do I create systems and processes? How do I, if you've listened to our clients talk about nailing the handoff and you're wondering, how do I dial in my pre-construction process? How do I clarify roles and responsibilities? How do I get my team on board with it? How do I implement these things? How do I change my business? How do I get out of operations or any sort of any of those questions? Then I would encourage you to ask a, a better question, which is who can help me achieve this goal? First of all, get clear on your goal that you want to accomplish and then draw a line through the word how and then replace it with who can help me get there. So if it's if you want to get better financial controls in place, ask who can help me get there. And I would encourage you to check out the apparatus contractor services team. And if you need help with pre-construction, designing your business to run without you, um, freeing up your time, if you're wondering how can I get my phone to ring less, how can I increase we could do a better job of handing off projects. How can I design my business to run without me? Then I would encourage you to ask who. And that's exactly what we do. We have the Systematize Your Construction Business Program, and it's a five-step process that we walk our clients through. If you've listened to the podcast, then you can hear them talk about their results. And we'll help you establish your strategic or your performance specifications for your business. So you're clear on what you want this business to to do for you. What are the outputs? We'll help you create your strategic blueprint, the organizational design and the financial model of how it's going to run. And then we're going to help you create your pre-construction process. There is a pre-construction deficiency in a lot of businesses. They're dealing with the just enough to start trap and all of the chaos that's caused by that. And then we're going to help you document that process. So you have a, this is how we do it manual that your team can refer to and you can train new hires on. And then we'll give you a set of leadership systems that your team can use to plan further in advance in more detail, turn your doers into planners and solve problems in advance. So if you're looking for a who, to help you achieve those goals, then we'd love to talk with you about that. That's exactly what we focus on. Um, and the first step would be to go to our website, constructionleadingedge.com and tap the apply button, or you can simply go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply. And we'll get on the, the call. We'll dig into your business and we will talk about what working together looks like and um, help you eliminate the opportunity cost of how and help you achieve your goals. So um, Manish, anything else that uh, we need to talk about? Anything else that stood out to you about this book that we would be remiss not to mention? I think the example of, um, you know, Michael Jordan as well, and regardless of how great he is, that the who's that were still needed were, you know, Pippin and the rest of, of the Bulls crew, but also Phil Jackson. Like, like he was a who that was needed to unlock Michael Jordan's full potential. And it's probably the same principle. No matter, you know, again, being high achievers, you still have blind spots. You still need someone to look through. And, you know, I know you don't, you're, you're a bit too humble for this, Todd, but the fact that you've been doing this since 2014, it's been 10 years. Like you can't, you don't exist uh, in this field for 10 years unless you're obviously delivering results. And it's important to kind of, for me to bring that up uh, because for the people that are listening, you know, we wouldn't still be doing this 10 years on if what we were doing wasn't working. So there's been, you know, hundreds of businesses that have come through this program and have gone through to a level of success themselves as well. And it's obviously something that's helped them, not just in their business, but in their personal lives as well, which to me personally is much more emotionally rewarding to hear our clients tell us about 
how their their marriages improved, how their family dynamics improved, because they now have more time to pay attention to those parts of their lives. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks, Banish. Um, Leah, what about you? Anything else that resonated with you in um, in the book that we should talk about? You know, I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Manish said, because um, you engaged with these principles a few years ago. You know, you were you were a one man show and you decided I need to find some who's and you've built a team. And now we've been able to help so many more folks. And it's rewarding for all of us. And it hasn't been transactional for you either. You've made this very transformational for everyone, which has allowed me to make transformational relationships with clients as well as Manish and like Manish said, it's very rewarding for us to hear some of the results that come from our clients. And it's because we became who's for you <laughs> and we helped our clients to find the right who's for them. And it's kind of just this ripple effect of really great things that are happening. And, uh, you know, it's, of course, I say this often, but it's very rewarding for me and an honor to be able to work with folks and to help them reach that capacity. And so uh, if you're in a place where you're feeling that poll, you're feeling a little bit stuck with what's going on, reach out and find the right who. Uh, take a look at what we have to offer because I think you'll find some good things here. Mm. I, I just want to add one more thing. I, I won't mention our client's name, but there's a client in particular right now who you know has resolved his business and obviously his business seeing results and it's freed up time for him to then start going, all right, what else do I want to achieve with my life? But what unfortunately has happened is that his elderly father – He's pretty much dying at the moment, but he's currently got the time to spend the time with his dad and you know look look out for his last interests and stuff like that. Which, if he was still stuck in the business, he would not have been able to do. And you know, we always look at this whole who, not how, and and goals and everything as to what do we want, what's the next mountain that we want to climb, etc. But life always happens, and something always pops up. And you want to make sure that you have time and space available so that you can tend to those things instead of always being stuck in a hamster wheel that you can't get out of. Yeah, that is, that is such a good point. And um, yeah, it freedom. That's the way the book is structured. It talks about freedom, freedom of time, freedom of money, freedom of relationships. And we, we have to have freedom. We have to have margin because life happens. Parents get sick. We have health issues. Somebody needs help. Stuff happens. And there's nothing bad about having, there's no downside to having freedom of time, freedom of money, freedom of relationships, freedom of purpose. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good point. And yes, Leah, you're exactly right. I embraced this, this concept a few years ago when I was thinking, how can I possibly do this? And the answer was, I can't. And you came along and you were my who. And then not too long after that, it was like, how do we, how do we support more people? And then Manish, I had a conversation with you and you came on board. So thank you guys for being very impactful who's in my life and in what we do and and you guys are very powerful who's for our clients and um, so thanks i appreciate it all right we're going to wrap it up if you if you're listening and you want you want some help you want to know what working with us looks like and see if you're a good fit then head over to constructionleadingedge.com if you want to listen to some of our clients talk about their results from working with us hit the results tab you can listen to some customer success stories or the first step in working with us. The first step all of those people took was to click on the results or the apply button on our website or go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply. Fill out the forms, share some information about your business. And if it looks like we're fit, we'll, we'll get on a call and uh, talk about how we can help you get where you want to be. Hey, Todd here. Before you go, thanks for listening. If you get value out of this podcast, if you could leave a rating or a review on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you consume this content, that would be great. And then if you are tired of waking up in the middle of the night, thinking about project details, worrying about cash flow, 
If you're tired of being stuck in day-to-day -day operations, putting out fires, if you're tired of not having enough documented processes and systems in your business, if you're tired of being hammered by the just enough to start trap and you feel stuck, if you want to grow your business and you want to know the right process to do it, if you want to have a roadmap to follow and a proven system for that, then there's a five-step process to systematize your construction business. And the team here at Construction Leading Edge specializes in that. That's exactly what we do. And we've helped over 300 companies do just that. If you would like our help, if you'd like to talk about what that looks like, the first step is to go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply, or you can go to our website, constructionleadingedge.com and tap the apply now button, or you can simply send a text with the word apply to this number. 877-755-2410. Just send the text, a text with the word apply to 877-755-2410 and my team will get back in touch with you. Thanks for listening. See you next time.